Okay, so first thing, I want to thank you to thank the webcam team for inviting me. And uh, I also want to thank all of you for coming. Uh, so before we start, uh, I think the best thing out of the conference is that you can get our connections. So if you have someone in front of you or uh, behind you, please introduce yourself. So just best case scenario, you will have two more persons that you know out of the conference. Come on, don't be shy. Okay, so without further ado, I will start. So a little bit about me. Uh, I'm, my name is Dusko. I'm 23 years old. I'm I come from Novi Sad, from a small software studio called Code Tribe. And over there, I'm a front-end developer. Uh, also, I put some Twitter bio generator. It seems that it hit like the right spots about me. And also, I'm a champion in a couple of eating competitions that I'm really proud of. I may not look like that, but I can really eat a lot. OK, so this is my tribe. Not all of them, but most of them. Uh, this is a picture we took from uh, Belgrade Airport uh, while we were going to Thailand. We went there uh, to work remotely for the entire month. And that was the decision we made as a, I would not call team, as a tribe, because we wanted to reward ourselves uh, for the hard work that we've done over the last year and to further uh, bring more relationship be between us. So, yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is how can we grow a team? Uh, and it has become really like hard to do that because uh, in a modern world of software engineering, we have so many technologies. We have so many programming languages. We have so many tools and ways how we can do some stuff. And it's really hard to find sense in all of it. So if I may be doing some not just development, but I'm primarily on, on the client side doing JavaScript, am I a full stack developer? Or if I'm a project manager, but I do some lightweight QA testing, am I a tester? So it's really hard to find like a balance, and it's hard to define what you actually are inside the team. So uh, stuff that I'm going to talk about today are the, the, the core concept, the definition of team, how we can build our craft, so how we work, and how we can build our cult culture inside the team. So yeah, team, the core concept, I mean, if you look at the tribe, as a definition, it also make, make like the same point. Uh, basically, team are a group of people who, uh, who has like common goal and they share rewards. And that's the most important thing about the team because uh, if you have like a group of people that are not working together, they're just a group of people working on the same project, they would not be as, as much productive as they can be. So, the thing is how, uh, how we are going to build a team are some of the models that we are implemented and that's what I'm going to talk about today. So let's take like a minute to look at this GIF. Uh, this is like a concept how much time you need to finish a task and how much time you need to finish it with a like not a normal team. So you start to analyze the problem, you size the effort, you write user stories, then you assign stories, then ask questions about those stories, then you wait for the business replies, argue about requirements, rewrite stories. <laughs> Everyone started working random. Schedule a meeting with, uh, I cannot read that fast, but you got the point. So <laughs> it's really hard. I mean, if you not, don't have a productive team, this is what usually happens. Uh, about the last thing will be most fun. <laughs> I should probably put some music behind it, but yeah. <laughs> now comes the best part. <laughs> yeah, OK, so I made my point. <laughs> and that's what usually happens in a team that's not like well prepared and when you have a group of people that don't know each other so well. So what I'm going to talk about is what can we do to improve on that? So first thing first, build a craft. So software engineering has developed so much over the years. Now it's not really like a 
child anymore. We have so many languages, so many techniques, and the term fatigue has come like last year. And I think it's really bliss. I mean, we have so many ways how we can accomplish something or do something. But on the other, on, on the other hand, that makes a, a big problem because you don't know what you're actually building or what languages do you actually know. So you cannot define any more uh, junior from senior to senior. So that, that's a really big problem. And that's what happened to us. Yeah. So what can we do about that? Uh, back then, about, I don't know, 10 years when I haven't even been a developer, we have a fairly easy split. I mean, you had web development, uh, or term of mobile development wasn't even active at that time. You didn't have like responsive design, you didn't have patterns, you didn't have toolings. So it was pretty simple to divide what each person should do in a team. Now, it, be, it has become more complex. And how can we build a team around something so variable? Uh, usually, uh, if you're not prepared for it and you don't have any clues how to do it, uh, chaos emerges. And the thing that comes out of it are unquality software by accident. So nobody wants to write bad code, right? And I mean, you have some people who are <laughs> really just come to work to go off from work to just earn money and do nothing else. But most of us are really trying to improve ourselves all the time. So even with all that, we somehow end up with uh, inconsistent and buggy UI. We have bad code. Th that bad code is hard to maintain, maintain and scale. And it's not as performant as we imagined it in the beginning. Um, so what can we do about it? Uh, we talk about language style guides, code reviews, and pattern libraries that we implemented in our company. OK, so language style guides. What, uh, probably the most thing that you should get out of it are shared coding standards. Because uh, it's, if you even have a well-prepared uh, team and some, someone new joins it, if you don't have like, a definition of how you work, he will, uh, really, uh, it will be really hard for that new person to start working immediately. So consistency is a key. You need to have a well-documented, a well-prepared uh, like process of how you build your software from the early on. And that will help uh, other people from your team or the new people that come to your team to reach out to that code, understand it, and start working immediately uh, right after they see that. And also, uh, with uh, like shared knowledge, uh, you, you will uh, be, it would be much easier for you guys to read your own code in like six months or one year. I had so many, I, so many times I read my own code from like one year before I actually wrote it and, well, before I wrote it. And the problem is I couldn't even read what I write. I was like, what did I, uh, what did I write back then? What, <laughs> what is this doing? If I look at the other person's code, it, it was the same thing. So, uh, if you build something, uh, find a certain pattern, uh, uh, you need to enforce it. So basically, we all have uh, stuff like daily scrum meetings, we all have stuff like coding reviews, but if they are not enforced, people will not uh, be obliged to get used to it. So you have to find the proper balance between that because if we have, um, we have all that knowledge, we made all the patterns, we made everything, and we are not enforcing it, people will just forget about it in like one or two weeks. Uh, the way how we implemented uh, tracking how our employees work is that uh, we started to track uh, exactly the amount of time each uh, employee is working on certain task. So it's not about, okay, at the end of the month, I just pointed you, you didn't work for like 10 hours each day and you didn't complete that task, or you didn't feel comfortably with doing something else. It's like we want to show each employee how much progress he has made the month before and how he can improve his work and his knowledge the, the month after. So, but uh, also, the big thing is we usually are stuck with clients that don't know exactly what they want. And that's a big problem. Uh, so that's why you, have, you guys have like product managers and project managers that need to enforce your way of programming and your way of building a product to your clients. 
Uh, I mean, we have a guy in our company who can convince a client to start learning programming to fix our bugs because he will convince him that this is the right thing to do. And you should have a person like that. You should enforce your rules and that way you will show your client that you care about their product. But you need to show that them with proof because if you don't have proof why something is better over their design or their way of thinking, they will not uh, agree with you on that and they will lose your trust and that's a big problem. So we need to scale our guide so that we could scale our team. So uh, standards are here to make things easier also. And if you have a complete standard, well-defined, if someone, someone starts working on another project, it, stuff like folder structure or naming conventions, if I know that like models in applications are exactly in one place and I start working on another project and I have a task to make another model or something, I will know exactly where to find them. Even if it's a completely different thing, completely different project, complete, completely different story. Uh, some stuff you can enforce, but they don't, uh, they are not as useful as they should be. So if you came up with stuff that are not useful and that are making a team less productive than they can be, you should just throw them out. So it's all about finding a perfect balance in your team. How, how can they work together? And uh, when you have such structure, it's easy to sh uh, have like a shared definition of quality because each of the projects you work on will have the same level of quality from the beginning to the end of the project. Well, uh, okay, so code, code reviews. Another one of the like, most important thing because as developers, usually a lot of times we don't have much like times to actually finish something the way we want. So we stitch up something together, we push it, it, it get through code review somehow, and the two months, three months after that, all hell broke loose when we try to scale it. And that's, <laughs> that can become a big problem because if your team is working on a bad code that they write, the, the, the depression will come out of them and they will not be as productive as they can be. And also, it's a waste of your time, waste of your time that you're billing to a client because you, when you write a bad code, you have to refactor it, you have to merge it again, you have to explain to a client why the first solution was not as good as the, as the new one, but they are still doing the same thing. And it's really hard for project managers to explain that to clients because they're all like, Okay, it's working. Why should we like, re rewrite it again? And uh, with code reviews, what we have done is uh, we implemented a certain like a pattern how we do code reviews. So we have uh, each like Git message that uh, we push with our code needs to contain certain things: the task that you're working on, the kind of task that you're working on. So is it an uh, improvement or a bug or um, I don't know, but regular task. And you have to um, push like a self-descriptive Git message that when I uh, go through the Git history and want to see what my colleague has done, I want to start working on something that he has worked on, I can easily start working on it just off reading that Git message. Um, pattern libraries are also a really cool thing. Uh, most of us, uh, I mean, most of us in Serbia are outsourcing companies, so every client is different, and you have all that different designs. You have uh, some client builds an application for hotels, some clients build an application for doctors, and it's hard to find a pattern that will apply to every project. And the way how you, you could do that are the, like the regular standards that we are so trying to accomplish uh, to write a clean code. Uh, so for example, you have folder, folder structure that you can enforce on every project. You have, for example, if you're using some kind of a bootstrap or a any other like front-end framework, you can build a pattern that will apply to every project and then customize it on your needs for every single project. And that, that's really easy because you can build a framework or a pattern or anything once and you don't, don't have to rebuild it over again all the time. And 
Also, it makes sharing the code very easy between colleagues and common starting point for new projects because you already have a certain architecture that is really good that can be applied to anything and when you start a new project, you already have like a boilerplate that you can use for it. Okay, so why bother doing that? Uh, we save a lot of time with these standards. We solve a problem once and just expand on them after. We make more people contribute to certain tasks because if all the team is included in code reviews or included in building some, some certain tasks, they all have a knowledge of, of that pattern that we are trying to enforce. And with those boring tasks, so for example, starting a project, you have to write all those routers and stuff, you can make a generator do that for you, and then you can have time to actually think about impactful features that are actually hard to implement, and you have more time to do that. Um, also, so another very important thing is to build a culture. So when we talk about building a culture, we usually think of like Google offices or Microsoft offices or any other like company with over a million employees. And okay, so I'm in a company with 20 or 30 people and I'm thinking to myself, I don't have resources to build all that. I don't have a fancy office or I don't have, uh, my colleagues don't have old MacBooks with the latest hardware, but small things can really make an impact on your colleagues. So what we uh, did, uh, we asked ourselves certain questions. So how our team make decisions? How and when we will experiment with new tools? Uh, when we should change, uh, change our dev stack? Or what principles might the team lean on to make those decisions? And we all do that collectively. Uh, every month we have a uh, um, retrospective on what have we done the, that, that month? Uh, what can we improve on it? How can we, do we have a certain problems between each other? That's one of the biggest problems because when you have someone new come to, the, to, to your office and a couple of colleagues are not uh, agreeing with him, it's bad. And it, it shouldn't be put, put it away. We should talk about that problems and trying to find a solution how, how we can change that. Um, so all the stuff from like Happy Fridays, we can do demos, we can do lighting talks, we can try to include uh, life off work to mean something for the company. So we usually in our company make barbecue weekends, we uh, usually go to pubs, we organize hackathons between ourselves, we go to, to Thailand for entire month to work remotely because we wanted to do something for the team that they would appreciate and it turns out that the team was like 20 or 30 percent more productive in Thailand than we were in our base office in Oisad. So also you can force developers to do certain things. Uh, for example, I really hate writing backend and I have a guy who is perfect backend developer but when he has to do something practical with the design he would kill everyone who asked that of him. So try to enforce your colleagues to learn something that they are not especially good at, just so that you, they can know how to appreciate your work. It would be really easier for you guys to communicate if you appreciate the other person's work and you know how much time he has to spend on every single task. Um, yeah, I mean, the team is the team as long as it works. So if you have a guy who is standing out, maybe he's not exactly a person you should talk to. Maybe he's not exactly a person, person who can fit in your team. So if someone stand out, get, I mean, it's, it's hard to say, but get rid of him because if he is disturbing your team productivity and team collaboration and the relationship that each member have, he's not fit for that role. And how can we continue to build on that? Uh, every single company that you work on will have different problems. Some can be managed, some can be argued about, some can be uh, enforced on people, but I cannot tell you like the perfect way to actually manage to do certain stuff. You can implement technical stuff, you can implement easily. You can implement stuff like pattern libraries and code reviews to allow new, uh, new people on your team and current people on your team to get uh, easily 
productive on other projects, but the actual relationship between colleagues is different in every single company, and that's normal. You just need to organize a certain amount of meetings and argue about the, every single issue that you guys have so you can be more productive and you can build on your relationship. Uh, yeah, don't optimize for perfect code base, optimize for making an impact. That's what we said, says in our company. Uh, yeah, I was, <laughs> thank you. A little bit faster than I expected. Yeah, you can all contact me if you have any problems in your team. We started uh, from like five persons and we had a big trouble starting working together when we started our company and somehow we managed to form a stable and friend friendly team all over the past year and a half that we exist. So if I can be of any help, feel free to send me an email and we can organize something. Okay, so any questions maybe? Uh, actually, so right now we have like 15 people in our office and we have a couple of people that are working remotely and we also have people from our clients that are like designers and organizers, product owners that are working closely with our team. How good is the internet in Canada? Uh, <laughs> all, all fiber optics, so I was pretty amazed. Okay, that's the only thing good. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty cheap, I mean... Um, for us, it took like, I think, 10k euros for the entire month for the whole team um, building and uh, uh, traveling expenses. So, not that expensive. Yeah. Uh, how do you work with remote products? Uh, okay, so we put some flexibility to working hours, but uh, usually we plan our every single sprint in advance. So, if we have certain meetings, uh, the guys that are working remotely have to be there. And uh, we, st okay, so we have flexible hours, but at some point in your day, you have to be online. So if a people asking for you, you have to be there or else you won't be part of the team. I mean, it's hard to work with remote people usually, but if you enforce uh, your way of thinking to them and you try to balance their time as they are working in your company, it's not that hard. It's just means of communication. It, it doesn't matter if you're talking on Skype or in person. Yeah. Uh, you said you have pull requests reviews and stuff like that to make like, code nicer. How many conflicts do you get when people don't agree on something in pull requests? Uh, okay, so... How do you solve those? Actually, so... That, that's, that, yeah, that's a big problem, but... Uh, sometimes you have to enforce like certain rules, so... You have the guys who's most experienced, and if 10 guys are not going to stick to the one solution, we vote on which the solution is best. And usually, you, you will get some that will stick out. 